uh, dear attendees, senior colleagues and panelists, uh, it is with great pleasure and ultimate honor I welcome you to the seventh session in 2021 and the 63rd session of the MEGA uh, Medical Association. Uh, on behalf of the Educational Board of the MEGA Medical Association and the Egyptian Society of Anesthesiology, I would like to thank each and every one of you for the efforts you are doing to keep uh, the flow of learning and the curve of education rising. Uh, thank you for your time every week, your patience during the mishaps and the uninterrupted support all the time. Uh, today, we're, uh, we are welcoming back Dr. Um, Samir Al-Ansari to our speaker side, together with uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Adil Abdel Fattah Saleh, uh, Professor Dr. Khalid Yassin, and Dr. Iman Nada. On the moderator side, uh, allow me to welcome Professor Dr. Mohammed Ibrahim, uh, Professor of Anesthesia and Intensive Care, Alexandria University, Cairo, Egypt. Uh, Alexandria University, Egypt. Uh, Dr. Mohammed uh, is also the reviewer uh, of the Egyptian Journal of Anesthesia, and he was the president of uh, Alexandria Society of Anesthesia and Intensive Care 2019. Uh, also on the moderator side, um, I'm glad uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Raisam Manna'a, uh, Professor of Anesthesiology uh, at Asyut University, Egypt, uh, Head of uh, Neuroanesthesia at King Khalid uh, University uh, Hospital, uh, KSA, and he is also the editor of Austin Journal of Anesthesia and Analgesia, and he is the reviewer of Saudi Journal of Anesthesia and the Anesthesia Essays and Researches. Uh, Dr. Raisam, uh, please start. Now, uh, my colleagues and my professors, this is the time for the second session. And uh, just to mention, I was very lucky enough in 2001 to uh, spend one year in University of California, San Diego, UCSD. And when I was there, uh, I saw at the floor, uh, at the roof of the hospital, uh, there is an airport for uh, helicopter and I asked for this. They told me that this is specifically for the team of the transplant. Uh, it was, uh, I asked the team of the transplant, they were doing uh, liver and uh, uh, kidney transplant, of course, and uh, heart lung transplant. And it was very hectic for the team of the transplant because most of the time it was uh, like an emergency. We are so proud in Egypt that we have uh, such centers. And uh, in uh, my uh, university recently in Asyut, we have a center for uh, liver transplant. But the leader in Egypt is the uh, Minufia University, of course. Uh, they have the experts in uh, the liver transplant both in the uh, surgical field and of course in the uh, anesthesia side. And one of these uh, leaders and the experts in Munufia University is Dr. Khalid Yassin, of course. Dr. Khalid Yassin, he is uh, one of the leader in uh, well known in the Middle East for uh, liver transplant. And he had, uh, he got his MS C from Alexander University, MD from Ain Shams, and he is a fellow of the Faculty of Anesthesia, Royal College of uh, Surgery uh, in uh, Ireland. Uh, he uh, attended in the uh, King Faisal University College of Medicine, Al Ahsa, Saudi Arabia, as a professor. And of course, he is a, a senior professor of the uh, liver transplant in the National Liver Institute in Munufia University, Egypt. So he will give us uh, a very uh, interesting lecture about the uh, monitoring and uh, the, uh, ex his experience in the research uh, in the Institute of Munufia and uh, in, in Egypt. So please, Dr. Khalid, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Okay. Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Sam Manna, for the, uh, this very nice introduction. And I thank Dr. Saad Mahdi for uh, the opportunity to speak uh, to all of my colleagues, uh, anesthesia worldwide. Of course, I have to thank all the panelists 
Dr. Samir Al Ansari, Dr. Adil Saleh, your lectures were excellent. Um, I'm going to speak today about uh, multimodal monitoring, and I'm going to, to present a quick lecture about uh, uh, how we monitor our patients in Munufia University and how we, through these monitors, we did some research that ended up in one of the textbooks this month in London with King's College uh, in textbook of anesthesia. So um, I will go into very briefly into my uh, uh, lectures. This is Bismillah Rahman Rahim. This was one of the very nice uh, pictures that I took from the Louvre Museum in Paris. It's the porcelain. I have to uh, 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 con co mention my conflict of interest with the companies as a speaker. And this is my Munufia University uh, National Liver Institute. Uh, Munufia is a city for our international audiences between Cairo and Alexandria in the Nile Delta. Uh, this has been uh, uh, the idea of Professor Yasin Abdel Ghaffar. He's one of our famous hepatologist professors in the Middle East. And he thought that we should build this institute in the Delta in the middle of where we have most of our hepatitis C patients. We have two buildings, an old building, uh, which is where I started, and then the new building, which is now a, a very good building, well equipped, and a 420 bed room with a very good liver transplant program, both adults and pediatrics. I have here to thank uh, uh, Professor Magdi Khalil because He's uh, one of the important professors of anesthesia in our department. And he, well, while he was a, de a dean of the Liver Institute, he made a lot of efforts for this new building to come uh, into life. Objectives of this lecture, if I talk about non-invasive monitoring and all the monitors that we use, the lecture would not be enough. I will concentrate on two types of lectures and present our experience at our center into them. I will start with the anesthesia depth monitor, and then I will go into the minimally invasive cardiac output, which we name it as trans -usophageal dupla. And I believe that our center in the Middle East is one of the centers that is extensively using trans -usophageal dupla. And here I have to uh, make a note that trans -usophageal dupla is not trans -usophageal echo dupla. It is a different entity. So let me start with, this is our operating rooms in the old uh, OR, and you can see here our uh, anesthesia machines. You can see our uh, uh, radical seven uh, monitors. Uh, we keep our patients warm during surgery. This is one of our liver transplant surgeries. This is the new OR rooms. It's fantastic, well-equipped, and it gives us the ground that we can do uh, research. Uh, we used a lot of multimodal, non-invasive and invasive monitors during uh, not liver transplant surgery only, but any surgery related to liver patients. This is the type of patients we deal with, cirrhotic livers, and we have to go in and do liver resection for them or take the liver out and put a new liver in. This is a donor, for example. All the right lobe is out. So these patients need good monitoring because they, there's a lot of hemodynamic issues that goes around in these uh, patients. We need to secure their safety. So the issue of monitoring is quite important in our institute. When we go into the history of monitoring, we will find the least monitors that were uh, looked after were the sedation monitors and anesthesia depth monitors. This interest in sedation depth monitors started in the late 1990s, in the late 90s of the last century, and it's now becoming more extensive. We started with best monitors, and now we ended with patient state index monitors. The ideal situation: Why are we using an anesthesia or a sedative depth monitors? These monitors that we use, we use them during surgery to secure that our patient is anesthetized in an optimal level with no pain and no movement. So we must have an indicator. We also use them during endoscopes and when we are sedating patients in ICU in order to make sure that we are not 
overdo it. The idea is that we need not overdo it, so we go into deep anesthesia, and not do it uh, and become light anesthesia. This is one of our uh, uh, anesthesia depth monitors. It is the Anatropy. It's from General Electric. It is one of the monitors that we use for anesthesia depth monitors. And here I have two figures from our OR. The figure on the left side, here we can see the anatropy before we put the patient to sleep. We have two types of anatropy here. We have the response anatropy, RE, and we have the state anatropy. These two are different. Response anatropy looks at the electrical activity in the frontalis muscle of the forehead while the state anatropy looks at the brain. So we are starting with the patient, 191, this means the patient is awake. But in this figure on the right side, this is a patient intubated, anesthetized in an adequate level of anesthesia. You can see the entitled CO2 waves, and you can see the reading 44 and 44. This means that when the response anatropy reflecting the frontalis muscle of the brain, of the forehead, is equal to the state inotropy of the brain, means the patient is adequately sedated. If the patient is not adequately sedated, there will be a difference. And that difference can be large, and it indicates that maybe we need to give some analgesics like opioids, fentanyl, or alfentanyl. So what is this inotropy? Inotropy measures the irregularity of the EEG. So this is a regular EEG. So that's a high anotropy. This means the patient is light. This is low, uh, irregular amplitude of anotropy, uh, uh, which means the patient is well anesthetized. So anotropy provides an information on the state of the brain during general anesthesia, which is very important. These days, it's also been incorporated with cerebral oximetry. So we can measure actually the oxygenation in the brain cells as well as the anesthesia depth. This is very important in elderly. If we're going to anesthetize an elderly patient, it is preferred that we have this type of monitors on because then studies have proved that it reduces post-operative cognitive dysfunction and it reduce uh, uh, cerebral hypoxia from hypotension even. So with these monitors, we can smoothly anesthetize an elderly and uh, uh, enhance his recovery. Here, this is what we're looking at. If we have a response in atrophy at 100, your patient is fully awake. If it is between 40 and 60, your patient is anesthetized. If it is deeper than this, then you have to be here alarmed and reduce your anesthesia. In our liver patients, they suffer already from some sort of degree of hepatic encephalopathy. So we should really be very careful with our inhalation anesthetics. Very common, we can see an, a hepatic patients after anesthesia dropping to 20, deep anesthesia. Sometimes we have to reduce our anesthesia until we fall in the optimal region or range between 40 and 60. We used this in our teamwork in Minofia. We have a very good department there. We have almost 24 doctors. Uh, 20 of them are female anesthetists, very clever anesthetists. Our head of department now is Dr. Hassam Abdelfat. He's running the, the anesthesia department now. And uh, uh, this is one of our research projects that we did in 2012 and presented in the Euro Anesthesia. We found something very interesting. During anesthesia death monitoring of our anesthesia patients, during liver transplantation, using death we found that during the different phases of surgery, anesthesia requirements varies, and it can reach very low levels in anhepatic phase. Anhepatic phase for our young trainees is the phase during liver transplant when we remove the old liver and we still didn't put the new liver. We have to be very careful in this phase 
We have to reduce our anesthesia requirement guided by anesthesia depth monitors. Because if we don't, then the, our blood pressure and hemodynamics will be affected. So that was very good. We published that in Saudi Journal of Anesthesia. And then we went further, study the anesthesia depths in cirrhotic patients undergoing delivery resection to excise tumors. We found the same thing. If we don't monitor them with anesthesia depth monitors, we cannot reduce our sevoflurane consumption. When we monitor them with anesthesia depth monitors, our sevoflurane consumption was reduced and our hemodynamics were much better. Here you have to remember a very important point. We are excising a diseased liver. We are removing a tumor from that liver. And in the same time, we have to look after the remnant part of the liver. We need to keep it viable, but otherwise our patient can go into some sort of temporary hepatic failure post-liver resection. So monitoring our level of sevoflurane consumption and improving our hemodynamics is vital. This is our new OR, which contains more uh, uh, non-invasive monitors. Here we can show in the screen the uh, Massimo non-invasive monitor, and here we can show the BIS monitor as well. And I will tell you in the next few slides the difference between those two apparatuses. This is our operating room as well, and we have on top of it the electric, uh, the, the cardio uh, uh, cube, or what we call trans esophageal echo doppler which has been, is used in the UK on a wider scale. And in our department, we are using it almost in all our liver transplants uh, in Munufia and in our uh, national in, uh, tropical medicine institute in Cairo uh, Institute in Astra Al Ain Street as well. So we all know this bispectral index, but what is this PSI? PSI is named Patient State Index. It is similar to the BIS, but it comes from a different company. The most important thing about Patient State Index, it is fast. In 1.2 seconds, it will give you readings. This takes 30 to 60 seconds, and it is affected by electrocardiogram. So PSI is, is a processed EEG variable that can give you results about EEG changes in 1.2 seconds. And it can be affected by drugs, by cerebral perfusion, by temperature. That's why we have to keep our patients warm during surgery. It is an algorithm produced by the Brain Research Laboratory in New York in the University School of Medicine there. It has a normal range uh, for anesthesia, you have to be between 25 and 50. More than that, this is light sedation. So we use this light sedation in ICU. But in anesthesia, we have to be between 25 and 50. So that figure on the left side is adequate anesthesia. It's reading 36. This is the screen that we have to teach to our residents and our specialists in the Liver Institute. This is how the root set line screen views. Here you can see the EEG of the right brain. Here you the left side of the brain. Here you can see the EEG of the right side of the brain. So you can, you are monitoring. In this, they only monitor one hemisphere, but the new versions of this, they are now producing electrodes to monitor both sides of the brain. But here in the PSI, we are monitoring both hemispheres. And this is our anesthesia depth. But look at this picture down there. This picture with multiple colors. This is what we call density spectral array, which reflects the EEG. And it, from the colors here, we can know if our patient is anesthetized with propofol or if he is anesthetized with sevoflurane. But that is not important. What is important is to look at the spectral edge frequency, which is this white line. Between this white line in the left side of the brain and this white line 
in the right side of the brain, those two lines have between them 90% of the electrical activity of the brain. So that line here, this spectral edge line, represents the left side of the brain, and that one represents the right side of the brain, both of them running parallel to one another. I will show you in the next few slides the abnormalities when they happen and how this makes us understand that there is a problem. So the electrical activity is between the spectral edge array. This is the spectral edge array. And if we look at the marker here, usually under anesthesia, it is between 1.5 and 7.5. 10 is our maximum and if the unit is hertz. We look at our spectral edge uh, uh, frequency. Here it is reading 10. So he is having almost appropriate anesthesia. But if it reads 20, this means that our patient is waking up. So before the surgeon starts to feel any problems in the muscle tone, before we uh, and during recovery as well, we can see our patient's spectral uh, edge frequency moving upwards. If it moves upwards, means our patient is waking. Let's have a look here during cardiac surgery, during a bypass surgery, when our concern is about cerebral ischemia. This is a picture where we have burst suppression. Then in the next picture, during rewarming phase, we can find that there is no symmetry between both sides of the hemisphere. There is a partial hypoperfusion in one of the hemispheres. This is a picture of a patient who are waking him up. Here, look at the two spectral arrays, spectral edge frequency, they are going together. Then suddenly here, they diverge. They hear diverging. This is a sign of recovery. The patient is waking up. Here, I will show you a very short video from our OR in Munufia University. Here we have a BIS monitor, and here we have a, a said line monitor with PSI. Look at the readings of each one during extubation. Look at the diversion. We are extubating the patient right now, and he's waking up. And the reading is 90, he's waking up. So that's an important, uh, no, we don't want to repeat it. We can go to the next slide. So what else have we done? What else have we done? Uh, state line PSI was used in the uh, uh, intensive care to monitor our sedation levels, and it was compared to Ramsey sedation score, and it provided us with better hemodynamics and enhanced the recovery and enhanced our weaning. PSI was used with inhalational desflurane. We are using in Menufea, we started using inhalational desflurane to sedate our liver transplant patients in the postoperative period because sometimes they are so hemodynamically unstable that they can't tolerate uh, proper food. So we found that this fluorine preserves hemodynamic very well, but it must be guided with the anesthesia depth sedation. It was presented in Berlin in Germany in 2015 and was awarded uh, one of the uh, prizes for poster presentation. This is in our ICU. This is our PSI reading 67, which should be between uh, more than 50. This means sedation. So this is inhalational sedation guided with PSI. And this is our anesthesia machine. We used it in 2015. And in that time, we made some communications with Baxter and other companies asking for them to develop an inhalational sedation device suitable for ICU ventilators. That was now developed. And they now have a Myris uh, uh, machine, very small vaporizer that you can put in the ICU for inhalation sedation. But you must have your scavenging system, 
we can use charcoal, but now the virus is using the whole uh, vacuum for scavenging the uh, agents. The desflurane was much better in hemodynamics and ICU, and it preserved the systemic vascular resistance, much better. PSI was used to guide intraoperative dexmedetomidine. We use dexmedetomidine during liver transplant because it reduces the metabolic rate and it reduces our inhalation anesthetics. But it was when it was guided with PSI, it produced less hemodynamics. At this slide, I finished the half of the lecture. I still have at least 10 or 15 slides to demonstrate the chance of the Doppler, which I believe that Munufia University is one of the centers that is extensively using the chance of superficial Doppler. This transosophageal Doppler is very simple. You can just insert it through orally. It goes down into the esophagus, the lower third of the esophagus. It clips the aorta and measures the velocity in the aorta. And through that velocity, we will be able to measure a lot of parameters like cardiac output. It's been recommended by the Enhanced Recovery Society and Global Guidelines in the UK, nice recommendation for using it, and it's been used on a nationwide level at the NHS hospitals. This is in the OR, we can put it orally. In the ICU, we can put, pass it nasally, uh, and we can get the same readings. But what readings do we get? This is its position very close to the hours, and that's the CT scan. This is the wave we get from the car, RGQ. And this is the readings that is of our concern. Every anesthetist in our department have to understand this monitor. We can get cardiac output readings, we can get stroke volume readings, and we can get FTC, which is the alternative of CVP. There's a lot of talking worldwide about central venous pressure and how it does not reflect uh, uh, adequately the normal volumic status of the patients. Corrected flow time is the velocity of the blood in the out. It should not be less than 350 milliseconds. So here is 310. In the next graph, the next figure, we gave fluids guided by the corrected flow time. Here it improved. It became 386. And the stroke volume as well improved and the cardiac output. This is the way we are monitoring our patients intraoperatively, guiding fluid intake and guiding the hemodynamics as well. We use an algorithm which has been published in the British uh, Journal of Hospital Medicine, and this guides us through exactly how much colloids we need to give to keep our readings within normal range. These two examples, FTC is reading correct flow time, Again, should not be less than 350 milliseconds. This is the velocity of the blood in the aorta. The velocity of the blood in the aorta is reduced when the blood becomes viscous with no water in it. This velocity is 280 milliseconds. Stroke volume is low, but here after we gave 250, it improved to become 274. And stroke volume improved, but that was not enough. In the next, we gave more fluid until it raised to up 339 with a better cardiac output and stroke volume. So this machine, that apparatus, we did a lot of research work with it, and we feel more confident using it intraoperatively to monitor our patients in OR and in the ICU. What research we did, transosophageal monitoring in cirrhotic patients undergoing liver, it was presented in the European Society, and published in the Saudi Journal, it, it led to a reduce in the colloid consumption. And this led to reduction in nausea and vomiting and hospital stay. So outcome was really much better when we monitored our patient with transesophageal Doppler. We looked into our work as an observation study in liver transplantation using transesophageal Doppler as a sole cardiac output uh, uh, to monitor reperfusion hemodynamic changes during surgery. We could really, it was very helpful detecting peripheral vascular resistance, 
guiding hemodynamic intake and guiding fluid intake as well. That was published, and uh, for our surprise, it was a quite a popular article for many years. Uh, if uh, more than 5,000 uh, viewers, 650 downloads. Recently, we, pre we presented the urine assay 2017, uh, the PSI. Now we use multimodal monitoring. We use the anesthesia depths with the transesophageal Doppler. Even when we give tablet present to monitor liver transplant, we publish that in the clinical transplantation in 2017. Uh, we're going back. Let's go back. Okay. In the American Society of Anesthesiology, we took it further ahead and started using a transesophageal Doppler for our pediatric population. We ordered some uh, pediatric probes. Uh, we need to have enough numbers, and we started uh, using it during the liver transplantation and during CASI operations. CASI operation for our junior staff is a Japanese surgery oriented for biliary atresia children. These children are 90 days old. Liver transplants can be done for patients as young as nine months or one year. It is very difficult to monitor cardiac output in such a young age. We cannot use swan guns. We cannot use flow track or the pulse variation. Transesophageal Doppler gives us the solution. Again, we used and we compared it with electric cardiometry, but this is not going to be our topic today. We're talking about transesophageal Doppler. We presented it in the American Society, and it was uh, well received there. It was we were giving the, the the honor to present it orally in Boston in 2017. We were able using transesophageal Doppler to monitor the trend changes in cardiac output in pediatric population. And that was a good solution for this age. It helped us also guide fluid management by using the uh, corrected flow type. And we compared it with other non-invasive monitors like electric cardiometry, and we came up with a more recommendation that electric cardiometry will need further technological development. But transesophageal Doppler did a great job showing us trend changes of cardiac output. More importantly, it showed something very important to us, which is the changes in the systemic vascular resistance. That was very important for us because it helps us to maintain the mean blood pressure throughout surgery. When we were in America, we were presented by the, uh, one of the professors there, and he told us that they are also working on invasive, but in adults, and they did a more uh, modification. They allowed the apparatus to take in invasive blood pressure as well, data, and to take in the ECG. And all of these were incorporated to improve and perfect the uh, transesophageal Doppler probes. They also improved the probes, angles of the cameras, they made it wider angle, because one of the limitations of this technology is that the, when the surgeon works with his, their hands behind the diaphragm, sometimes they displace or move the electrode. So we have repeatedly during surgery to readjust the electrode. But with the new versions, with better cameras and wider angles, this was less needed. I am approaching the end of my lecture. I cannot uh, leave the lecture without mentioning the uh, great review that just appeared a few days ago. And I thank here my colleague Yasser Zaghloul in Abu Dhabi and a, a junior staff in our Department of Anesthesia and National Liver Institute, Mahmoud Al Munayri, who drew my attention to such a, a, a great a review uh, where we can see Ahmed Mukhtar, one of the known anesthesiologists and professor from Cairo University. He is contributing in this important review and consensus about uh, uh, the uh, about the um, uh, uh, hemodynamic instability and monitoring during transplantation. This slide shows how important work Ahmed Mukhtar is doing. He is using transesophageal echo Doppler 
uh, as a, and he found it to be a, a most sensitive monitor for myocardial ischemia during liver transplantation. He also found it a gold standard for monitoring uh, thrombosis, which can actually happen during liver transplant. These patients sometimes, liver transplant patients, are sometimes hypercoagulant. And this can go unnoticed if we don't have a transesophageal echo to it. There is also a, a, a great uh, uh, talk about the uh, accuracy of the impetus cardiographies like electrocardiograms and the arterial wave analysis forms. Uh, for further readings, if any of our junior staff would like to have, uh, this is one of the textbooks from King's College, where we had the honor to uh, present Munufi University in one of the chapters there. It has been out in the market in last month. Uh, 2021, and it concludes some of the other monitors not mentioned in uh, the lecture. I here have to uh, uh, contribute uh, uh, to Professor uh, Yahya Humimi, uh, who يعني, gave us a full sponsor in Munufia University for me and Magdi Khalil. We will never have reached this level of education or learning or scholarships or uh, giving us the MD degrees from Ain Shams. He facilitated all of, of our work. Uh, this is our ICU. you. Many thanks to our anesthesia department in Munufia, especially the young youths doing the MS and MD degrees because they were very honest. They were able to publish their research. They went all through the centers of the world from San Diego to Boston to Berlin and recently to Sydney to present their research, which helped us to uh, uh, show a brilliant picture or a bright picture of anesthesia and liver transplant in Egypt. Thank you very much and thank you for allowing me this time. Dr. Khalid. Uh... Thank you so much for this informative lecture. And all of us, we know the uh, effort and the big effort uh, which uh, to be done uh, in such subspecialities. And we are uh, so proud of uh, the uh, some of our centers uh, in uh, Egypt, uh, like uh, Minufeya, like uh, Mansoura for transplant and uh, other uh, centers, of course. Uh, I have just one uh, uh, question, if you please, about the uh, monitoring. Uh, uh, all of us, we know that the, uh, in liver transplant, a lot of monitoring uh, for the patients uh, and the uh, anesthesiologist should be alert all the time for, and it is a challenging uh, uh, subspeciality. Is there any difference or it is, is it the same regarding to the uh, nomination or the uh, name of uh, the monitoring? Uh, I mean, you mentioned entropy, PSI, uh, bispectral index, and also evoke the potential if we put on the same monitoring. Uh, all of these monitoring are the same, the same basic principle as processed EEG, or is there any difference? Generally, generally they are all the same. But as we share, said, some of them can give us more additional information. Like the, for example, the, the PSI can give us additional information about uh, uh, the two hemispheres of the brain, where we can face some problems, particularly in cardiac surgery during the rewarming phase. Enotropy on the other side can give us some information about the frontalis muscle uh, activity, which can be an early sign of pain if the patient is in light anesthesia. But generally, most of them are the same and most of them are correlating. If you feel uh, happy to use the BIS, use it. If you like to use enotropy, do it. If you're using the PSI, you can use it. So the same principle uh, is processed EEG for all? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have uh, a very active uh, colleague uh, asking uh, about um, uh, the using of uh, this fluorine in ICU. For how long you are using uh, this fluorine? Uh, in our liver transplant program, uh, usually many centers, our several centers, would like to have an early extubation. But in our situation, we are having a living related 
So we would like to ventilate our patients until we make sure that the new graft is working and kicking in, electrolytes are fine. We can ventilate them for maybe uh, uh, six hours, 12 hours, according to the results. Um, we use desferrin for inhalation sedation in hemodynamically unstable patients because sometimes they can't tolerate proper form. Uh, this furin uh, uh, is more adequate, much better. Recovery is very fast. Uh, you can use ciboferrin if you like, but we are afraid from the kidney problems with it in the liver hepatorenal syndrome. But we're using this frame much better. We don't exceed 12 hours uh, with it. But nowadays, of course, with the COVID-19, we are writing now a review article about the use of inhalation sedation. Uh, they, in Germany, they are getting now more interested in inhalation sedation. And they could say it has a better bronchial dilatation. It has uh, uh, anti-inflammatory effects. You, the recovery is faster because it relies only on the lungs and not on liver or kidney. So in advanced critical illness, uh, uh, you could use it. But uh, it has its problems in polluting the uh, uh, ICU staff. So now the, the whole thing had been uh, uh, improved by introducing anaconda with sharp call uh, exits and uh, mirus or mirus as they call it in Germany with uh, the uh, scavenging system through the, the, uh, the vacuum in the wall. So it's now gaining a lot of grounds in Europe and in Germany. And it's starting to gain some grounds during maybe the last two weeks. In Saudi Arabia here, they just approved anaconda Two cases were done uh, anaconda for sevoferrin inhalation. Two cases was recently done in El Shemisi in Riyadh Hospital. And uh, uh, Myris is on its way. So we might be going into an era where inhalation sedation could replace intravenous anesthetic agents because with COVID-19, there is shortage now of intravenous anesthetic agents. Very clear. Uh, by the way, how is the uh, flow uh, in the uh, Monofea University? Flow of transplant. The, the flow of doing the flow of transplant. transplant. We, are do we are doing at least uh, a case a week in Monofea or Cairo because the same staff are working here. You could say maybe two cases a week. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, can I have a question, please? Yes, please. please. Uh, uh, how can inotropy gives you an idea about the oxygen saturation of the brain? Uh, inotropy will not give me an idea about the oxygen saturation of the brain, but the new PSI said line monitor, the uh, sticker that we put on the forehead, has in it or incorporated a pulse oximetry for the cerebrum. So that's a new development. Oh. It is not in the inotropy. In duplication. Duplication. Yes, yes. Duplication. Uh, the other question is, uh, after the massive treatment of uh, uh, hepatitis C, uh, what about the rate of uh, flow? It, it decreases too much for uh, in Egypt? The rate yes, of, of transplantation after the, the good massive news, treatment of hepatitis C. The good C. news that this massive treatment of hepatitis C actually had a very positive effect on the incidence of hepatitis C in Egypt. It is one of the successful programs worldwide. Yes, we are seeing less cases of hepatitis C. We are now seeing more cases of fatty liver, more cases of uh, 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 other metabolic disorders, but hepatitis C is coming down, yes. But maybe it will take at least five to 10 years. Thank you.